So you have a cast of characters and each one has a different perspective on your premise. Cool. But if I were a betting fellow, I'd bet you wanted your plot to involve more than a philosophical debate in a white void. Characters don't just fight, they fight over stuff, resources, status, emotional needs. The question you need to ask about your unique characters is what's going to kick their conflict off and then throw that thing right in the middle of them and watch them go at it. I'm writing a feature about a group of siblings who happen upon a resource that could change the world. Obviously, whoever has control over that resource is going to drive the plot. The details are in the devil. But it's not always that easy. What if your premise is the passing of a patriarch? You've decided on that premise, you've created a cast of characters who all have different relevant perspectives on old granddad, but you can't think of anything for them to do other than talk about how they feel about him. Nothing wrong with that, of course, but let's say you want a dynamic plot with all sorts of twists and turns, and you're at a dead end because your premise doesn't automatically lend itself to such a plot. You might need to throw in the thing, the connector piece. Granddad owned a strip club. Bada bop boom, pow. So now you have a question of inheritance. All of your characters will show their true natures, not just by talking in a room, but by interacting with the thing. Who inherits the strip club? Now their feelings about Granddad aren't just feelings in a vacuum, they actually get to color and inform their actions. Maybe Granddad's eldest child is anti-strip club and wants to tear it down, but the younger child is like, stripping has been a family tradition for decades, how could you do this? And then maybe tries to sabotage them or change the will to keep the strip club in business. The thing I speak of is more than just an inciting incident, it's the medium you've added to connect the emotional plane to the physical plane. It's the link between story and plot. It's not always necessary, but sometimes if your spark of inspiration is more so an emotional one, you have to anchor those emotions in a physical object or a place or a situation. I had a writer email me that he wanted to write a story about Dutch spice trading and colonialism in the 1600s, and then he broke down his characters, each of them holding a different perspective on Dutch spice trading and colonialism in the 1600s. So you have your premise and you have your characters that belong in that premise, but it's lacking something. That premise is not presenting itself aggressively enough in their lives. It's not stirring the pot enough. All they can do is talk about it. But this is solved if you present them with a relevant choice. Instead of just some spice traders who have opinions on the state of affairs, there's some spice traders who have to make a choice between returning to the oppressive conditions of their homeland and becoming oppressors themselves in the so-called new world. So now these opinions aren't just talking points, they're doing points. Bottom line, sometimes you as a writer will have to position the characters appropriately so that they engage in meaningful conflict. <laughs> This is really truly just my creative process, but I found a way to write and not die of stress, and that must warrant inclusion. There's this constant idea in the writing community of opening up your laptop and looking at the blank page. There are so many possibilities. What do I do? The blank page. It's so intimidating. Just start. Just start writing. <laughs> no, no, no. Maybe that works for you, but I was stuck in a rut for so long because I took that stuff to heart. I have this tendency to obsess over a single word or line, even just the inclusion of a the. And I would start writing my screenplay the old-fashioned way, just going in blind and seeing what would happen. And after half a page, I would just have to nuke the entire thing from orbit because I felt so much dread and anxiety trying to figure out the specific execution of a scene while also being unsure of whether or not that scene should even exist. It's like drawing a face, but you just spend a bunch of time on the ear. And then when you're completely satisfied with the ear, you do the mouth. And you obsess over getting the perfect mouth. But then when you do the stuff between the ear and the mouth, you realize that all your proportions were wrong and it's bad, it's all bad. And then you remember why artists start with basic shapes and placeholders. It's to make sure that they get the low res image first before they go in and do details. So why is the outlining phase considered separate from writing? Why does outlining get its own word and why is it treated like a separate process? Why is writing so often characterized by just drafting and redrafting, just throwing dart after dart at the wall until your arm is sore and then coming back the next day and doing it again and again until finally you get a bullseye? Why can't I just build a hyper accurate dart gun and calibrate it perfectly? For me, the actual writing of words is the payoff, the moment all of my hard work comes together. Typing isn't inherently progress either. I might discover a cool tidbit or line that I can put in my pocket for later, but at best I'm wasting time, and at worst I'm crystallizing scenes prematurely and getting attached to them, which prevents me from being open to new possibilities. Look, look how dangerous it is to just start typing without a plan. I accidentally wrote 48 gigabytes of malware, and now it's literally headed straight for you. Yes, you. It's going to change all of your writing into copypasta murals, except they'll be misaligned, so they'll look terrible. But don't panic. There is a way out of this. You have to get... 
Atlas VPN, the sponsor of today's video. Yes, I finally have my first sponsor at last. Uh, I'd like to thank the Academy mom, dad, Susan, it's baby's first ad. VPN stands for very pretty cool, neat thing. Its function is to shield you from the chaos of the internet. Look around you, it's like the Wild West out here. And I don't mean like the cactus banjo, John Wayne smoking a cigarillo type Wild West. I mean like a modern deconstruction with all the dysentery and unstable infrastructure and the ever present possibility that your life might come to a swift and unsatisfying end type Wild West. But imagine, if you will, braving that unholy frontier in like some kind of mech suit that makes you invulnerable and the bullets just bounce off you like pew pew pew. That's what Atlas VPN will do for you on the World Wide Web. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a fat discount. Three year subscription, $1.99 a month, 30 day money back guarantee. You can use Atlas VPN on unlimited devices. No limit whatsoever. Look, it's not 2012 anymore. As much as I wish this whole internet thing began and ended with cool lighter apps, the reality is that it's more dangerous now than ever. The reptilian overlords are watching you. They know your search history. They know your favorite shows. They saw you cry when Netflix canceled 1899 and they mocked your tears. You need protection. But Atlas VPN doesn't just offer you safety. No, no, you'll have the power to bend space and time. In the US, I cannot watch Twin Peaks on Netflix. But with Atlas VPN, sure, I'm in Argentina. What are you gonna do, track me? Free from my geographical shackles, I can also obtain plane and hotel deals, save money on subscriptions, and just have an all-around groovy time. Atlas VPN has over 6 million users just on planet Earth alone, and you yourself can get a discount by clicking the link in the description. Click it, do it. Three year subscription, $1.99 a month, 30 day money back guarantee. Anyways, back to my writing process. I use sticky notes and columns. One column equals one scene. Each character has a color. If I see a blue sticky note and a yellow sticky note stacked vertically, I know this is a Billy Bob and Martha scene. On the blue sticky note, I write what Billy Bob gets up to, and on the yellow sticky note, I write what Martha gets up to. This way, I can chart the journey of each character as well as easily keep an eye on my pacing, which is a purely subjective thing, but a thing that matters to me nonetheless. Bring a friend, bring two, talk about your sticky note movie, look for bits that don't work, character attitudes that change between scenes, scenes that should be happening but are missing, move stuff around, and then only when the whole thing works like a well-oiled machine, type a first draft. If you're writing a screenplay, use actual screenwriting software, not just because professionals will laugh at you if you don't, but also because it forces you into a format that lays your information out very quickly and stops you from getting sidetracked. I decided I wanted to become a screenwriter when I was 15. I used Google Docs until I was 20. Don't be like me. I'm a dingus. The blank slate model of psychology is not scientifically true. Genetic factors do influence a person's temperament. Things like their capacity for addiction, certain life-altering diseases, as well as all manner of neurological and social differences. My brother is just freakishly better at math than me, despite the fact that we received the exact same education. A person can simply be a certain way due to factors that are beyond anyone's control. And you as a writer can't entirely avoid this. In the house of the D, the plot is often shaped by the sex of a child. Total dice roll, no causality, you can't tie it to any character choices. George just gets to play God and decide that random variable which has huge consequences. But when possible, I find it impractical to rely on the idea that a character simply is, especially when it comes to beliefs. You have your premise, you have your cast, they all have differing opinions, and you could just go from there. But slow down. Have a cup of tea, one of the brands with the string so that it hangs off the side and everybody knows that you're drinking tea, and see if you can answer this. Why are your characters different? Say you have two brothers. The older one is super analytical and the other one lives vicariously through internet personas because he's based and schizopilled. And the reason for these differences is just because they are that way. It's kind of lame. Lore time. The younger brother was given more attention as a child because he was the youngest. The older brother was resentful and sought to quantify and master the world around him because it was his way of being strong. The internet brother eventually realized that maybe he should have paid more attention in school, but now it's too late and he resorts to getting praise on the internet to affirm his worth as a human being and make up for the fact that he never took the time to hone his skills. And just like that, I've created an appropriate backstory for these two characters, one that explains why they are the way they are when we meet them on page one. I did it by doing the dominoes thing but in reverse. Instead of asking what is the logical next step for these characters, I asked what logically would have happened to get them to this place. You can do this to create a few years worth of backstory, or if you need to, you can create 300 years. And when you have that backstory, you can cherry pick from it when you're writing your dialogue, depending on what's relevant to the current scene. But the most important thing is that you give your backstory the same respect as you give your main story. The rules are a little different, like if your inciting incident is some unlikely event, as most are, it obviously doesn't have to be part of an existing sequence of cause and effect, it can just happen. 
What's important is that you respect the consequences of a random event and allow cause and effect to follow through from there. Tyrion Lannister was born a dwarf. This was a random genetic event, and George explores it in such excruciating detail and with such immense respect for psychology and social norms that it's integrated fully into the story. But whenever possible, he does his lore the service of causality and internal logic, and as a result, it's able to be adapted into an A-plot of its own. What I'm getting at is that backstory should be a valid extension of your front story even if you never show it. Here's the beginning of your story and here's the end. If these two lines intersect, it means you have a contradiction, but you're good, right? Because they don't intersect. No, false, they do. Just because you don't see a thing doesn't mean it can be discounted as meaningless backstory trivia. Make sure your lore is solid or it'll come back to bite you in the ass. Trust me, as the guy who made an Instagram page solely dedicated to bugging people who use the term POV incorrectly, I think about this way too much. You have your timeline, you know the beats of your story, you can chart the journey of each character, and now you're at a point where you're starting to figure out the specific sequence of scenes. This is a different phase. You were in the canon phase, and now you're in the presentation phase, and I do consider those to be two different things. Because there's the objective canon of events, and you've got that figured out and it's airtight, but you're not ready to start typing yet. Because now you gotta take your canon and present it to the audience in the most efficient and subjectively the most impactful way you can. There was a time when I really didn't like The Thing, because the narrative follows Kurt Russell 90% of the time, but then sometimes it'll arbitrarily show us something he doesn't know about, presumably to create dramatic irony and make us fear for him. But then, when we're back with Kurt, the movie will go, Ooh, I wonder who's secretly The Thing? Is Keith David The Thing? Ooh, I don't know. As if we're supposed to only know what he knows, despite the fact that the movie has already expressed a willingness to cut away and show us stuff he doesn't know, which always left me a little pissed. Like, this is only scary because John Carpenter is playing God and selectively withholding information, and part of me still wishes the script was anchored on a single POV, and not arbitrarily jumping around to manufacture intrigue, but a far more important takeaway from this is the fact that POV matters. A lot. When you write your canon, you essentially just have a Wikipedia page full of information, but now you gotta filter all of that through your intention as a writer. How you do that is purely an artistic choice. I can't speak to any specific techniques, but I do think the importance of sticking to one point of view varies depending on how visceral you want your story to be. Visceral meaning the emotional and physiological reaction of the audience is the point. But if, for instance, the intrigue of a mystery is front and center, I'm not going to cheat the audience by giving them a clue the protagonist doesn't have. The choosing of a protagonist, if you do such a thing, is also part of this step. But bottom line is, be aware that having your canon is only the beginning. You could present all of that information to your audience raw, or you could season it, cook it, and serve it with garnish on a silver platter. Objectively, nothing changes, but subjectively, very few people are going to say the information isn't more fun to consume this way. Really, if I didn't want to talk about this, I would have just left it at 9, but it's important to me because it took me a while to figure out. I'll keep it brief because I'm sure you all have somewhere to be. I've drained my bank account into my own student films, and I've done a little PA work in the industry, but at 21, for the first time in my life, I can pretty much say I'm getting paid for my writing here on YouTube. So if you're the type to fall for an appeal to authority, calling myself a professional writer might help you internalize this a bit more. It's not supposed to be easy. Like, I know I come at this from a very confident angle, but honestly, I follow all of my advice and I still struggle. I only entertain the possibility that my system might be worth sharing because it works for me better than any other system. But regardless of what your process is, it's not natural to be a never-ending fountain of creativity. I've accepted the fact that pacing around in anguish for seven days might just be the price I have to pay for my next good idea, and when that idea finally comes, I don't tell myself that those seven days were wasted. Because the mind is a complicated beast. Thinking is writing, outlining is writing, resting is writing, just think of it like that. Do whatever you have to do to incorporate writer's block into your process, because it will happen, no matter how driven you are, and you can't fight it. You just have to let it pass through you. That's all I got. Thanks for entertaining my rambles, I know this was another mini video. I I wanted to filter feed some ad revenue by concentrating on my shorter scripts because winter utility bills are very bad here in Ohio, and I know that I won't be able to release my big projects until the spring. But shout out to my subscribers, shout out to my Ko-Fi compatriots, shout out to the living, shout out to the dead, shout out to the undead, and shout out to unprocessed mustard, like with the whole mustard seeds in it. Mm.